So the next section is going to be the re regulation okay. compliance panel. Um, and then we're going to have Neha Narula, a director of uh, MIT DCI, Patrick Merck from Trans Transparent Systems, uh, Lindsay Lin from Stella, who will join us remotely. And uh, it's going to be moderated by Galen Moore from uh, Coindesk. Please join me and welcome the participants. Lindsay, are you there? No. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, she's. Okay. We'll, we'll wait a minute, Mark. You said that better. Yeah, but the computer's in there. <laughs> it's a governance problem. Definitely. It is? Oh, right. Everything's a governance problem. Well, we need to verify her identity first. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Okay, um, well, thanks for coming to the regulation panel. Um, my name's Galen Moore. I'm a research analyst at Coindesk, and um, I'll let the other panelists here introduce themselves. Please go ahead, Neha, Patrick, and Lindsay, when you're on. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Neha Narula, and I lead the Digital Currency Initiative, which is based out of the MIT Media Lab. Hi, I'm Patrick Merck. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at a company called Transparent Systems. Uh, before that, I was special counsel, or as I like to say, very special counsel, at the law firm Cooley, um, uh, where I co-led the blockchain practice, um, which is still going strong. Um, yeah. Lindsay, are you in there? Not yet. We're still waiting for Lindsay. Okay. Well, Lindsay is uh, general counsel, I believe. It's Stellar. Uh, and we'll go get ahead and get started without her while we're working on getting her. Aha. Admitted. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Lindsay, can you hear us? All right. Well, we'll oh, there she is. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's the sound? Lindsay, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself so we can figure out whether we can actually hear you. Uh, yeah. I'm Lindsay. I am the in house counsel at Stellar Development Foundation where I help my company um, think about uh, legislation, policy, regulation, especially as it pertains to how we operate and do business. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Uh, so Patrick and they okay. have introduced themselves and, and uh, you need no introduction to them. So uh, I guess let's get right into it. We had sort of parsed out a couple of questions to begin with that are pretty basic and high level. We're gonna go through those and then kind of see where the conversation takes us and hopefully we'll have you know, a good 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, so right off the bat, I think you know, the most important question is, is kind of what are the specific regulatory developments uh, that are important that people in crypto should be watching right now? And I think. You know, we're probably looking at this through a very U.S. lens, but but certainly open to discussion of any um, regulatory developments across the uh, globe. And Lindsay, I think I'd leave that one for you to start with. Um, you know, what are the yeah. developments in Washington that that you think are most important right now? Yeah. So, as a um, in-house counsel at a company that does develop a native blockchain protocol, I we follow regulatory developments very closely. And I think especially after uh, Facebook's announcement of Libra, there's been a lot of momentum in DC of essentially a lot of people in the House and Senate um, thinking about cryptocurrency and blockchain. And this has resulted in interesting pieces of legislation, such as um, managed stable coins, our Securities Act, uh, which was a piece of legislation that started, was introduced and um, was being started being discussed in uh, 2019, which said some types of stable coins would be considered securities. 
Um, and there's also uh, new uh, legisl new contemplated legislation, such as the Virtual Currency Fairness Act, which says uh, dispositions for of cryptocurrency um, that results in gain of under two hundred dollars would not essentially not be taxable. So there are there is a lot of action in Congress um, and a lot more focus in Congress about cryptocurrency and blockchain issues, especially in the past year. And I anticipate we will be seeing a lot more, a lot more activity this year too. <laughs> Let's start with that first one, uh, Managed Stablecoins Are Securities Act. Uh, this is uh, proposed in the US House, I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and would designate Libra and any other stablecoin as a security. Uh, Assuming I, I have that right, uh, Patrick, what, what would that do, in, in your opinion, to the stablecoin uh, category <laughs> in crypto assets? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I, I don't know what a stablecoin is exactly, but you know, I'm sure we'll figure that out eventually, too. Um, so that's usually the threshold question when we're going to introduce new legislation is, what the heck is this thing, and defining it properly. And I, I think that's actually a real challenge when we're talking about stablecoins and if we're going to do sweeping uh, technology specific regulation is that we we really have to spend the time to narrowly uh, define the thing that we're worried about right is it a managed stable coin like Libra because technically I mean I, I think people have argued that it's already a security right given at least some of what they've proposed to do although Libra is a moving target so you can't say Libra is right at least some of their proposals have veered into the territory where a lot of commenters have suggested it's already a security, in which case you don't really need new legislation to, to regulate um, the activity that they're conducting because it's already regulated. So introducing new legislation is just confusing, right? And potentially undermines regulators like the SEC who are already applying their existing regulations to the space. Why would you need new legislation if something is already a security, right? Um, so actually, I think that the first thing that we need to really think carefully about is what is a stable coin, or more precisely, what is the activity that we're worried about that we feel like needs to be captured within the securities law framework? Is it the idea that I'm going to collect money from retail investors, right, or retail people into an investment scheme where I actively manage the returns of the investment scheme? That seems like something that's already captured within that framework, and appropriately so. If I design a, a system where money is put into a network and we're using it purely to facilitate payments and there's no return, it's hard to say that's an investment scheme. And it would be a real shame if we started pushing legislation that moved that into the realm of securities regulation, which would be highly inappropriate. Right? and would forestall any sort of innovative new ideas in terms of making payments more accessible and faster. So we gotta be, if we're gonna do things like introduce legislation like the Stable Coins or Securities Act or something like that, we gotta be really, really careful that there's actually a problem that we're trying to solve here that isn't already solved. Is that a broader conversation that needs to happen with regulators in terms of understanding what, you know, where things might fit? I mean, Neha, I'd be interested in your perspective um, you know, is that kind of conversation happening to where governments are becoming more sophisticated about defining what is a stable coin, defining all the different uses and purposes that people come up with and how they might, you know, need to be regulated or how they might impact, um, you know, citizens? Yeah, so uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it seems like regulators really like to define things. and uh, That's good that, news, right? Uh, that worries me a little bit, oh. especially when um, the people building the things or trying to study and analyze them from a technical perspective still haven't figured out how to define things. Right. So as an example, um, Hinman's speech, where he talked about decentralization, uh, really scared me um, because I don't think we know what that word means. And to hear someone from the SEC using that word as a metric for something is really frightening 
to me because we really have no clue what that word means. We don't know how to measure it. We, there are lots of different types of decentralization. We don't know how to compare them. Um, it, decentralization isn't even really an end goal in and of itself. It's sort of a way we characterize a bunch of different things that fit together, like uh, something that's censorship resistant, something where there's no single point of failure. Uh, and so when I see things like that, I get really, really worried. Um, and I think probably the same thing would apply with terms like stablecoin. Um, what, what is the point of defining these things right now when they're still in flux? We're still trying to understand them. Uh, and we just don't even know the shape of what they're gonna be. I don't think regulation should come before we understand how something works. Uh, and I, and it, it worries me that it's so specific to the technology as well, because the technology is a moving target. We are, you know, these things are gonna keep getting invented. Two years ago, no one was talking about stable coins. Um, so, you know, we're gonna have a lot of new technologies and a lot of new words coming about. Um, and uh, I think we have to be careful with how quickly we want to pass legislation. And just to be clear, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a computer scientist. I actually don't know very much about regulation or compliance, so it's a little bit of a mystery to me while I'm on this panel, but I guess Nabil thought it would be fun. Um, but I'm happy to talk about my perspective. Always as, good to have you on a panel. <laughs> I'm happy yeah. to talk about my perspective as someone who occasionally has conversations with these folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a technologist approaching that and trying to understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to achieve is interesting. Well, and look, I mean, what are regulators about anyway? They're supposed to be about impact on a populace, right? And I think that's something that you and DCI think about quite a bit in terms yes. of how will crypto systems, how will uh, trust minimized systems impact um, society. Uh, so I think that's, a, I, mean, I mean, it sounds like from what you're saying, not only is proposing regulation fraught, but even the conversation about proposing regulation is fraught. Right, if you have a regulator saying, we're gonna talk about decentralization and decentralization is important. That's a, you know, whoa, 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 slow down. Is that <laughs> well, well, I mean, kind of I, that's kind of their job. So I do feel, I don't wanna say that they can't do their jobs. I just wanna acknowledge <laughs> yeah. that we need to be careful. And right. I do think there's a lot of excitement, which is great to see. People are excited. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I talked to, I remember having a conversation with some, some people from, uh, some staffers from Congress, and they said, we, you know, we're really excited about this. This mm -hmm. is fun for us. We enjoy learning about this and talking <laughs> about this. And so I think, you know, that's great. Uh, and it's wonderful that people want to get educated, but we don't need to define what a blockchain is or define, you know, some of these terms. So I 100% mm -hmm. agree with Patrick on that. Yeah. Yeah, you know that yeah. uh, lawyers are just coders who can't do math, right? Mm -hmm. no, we no, also no. don't like undefined no, 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 variables. No, 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 no. Lawyers are like frustrated that. writers, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Lindsay, yeah I think say? legislators are put in a very tough position because uh, the industry keeps on basically clamoring for more regulatory clarity. And then, you know, people in Congress, they introduce a bill, but then, as Patrick said, as Anne May has said, like, it's very difficult to define key terms properly. So then put in a tough position where, you know, people want more clarity, but then at the same time, it's very hard to be clear when this space has a lot of disagreements on definitions for the key terms and this has even a lot of philosophical disagreements. Yeah, Lindsay, that is a really good point, right? That it is, a lot of this is not, is driven from industry asking for clarity, which I think is a mistake most of the time, right? The, the, if, if all these rules were super clear, there would be no entre entrepreneurial opportunity, mm -hmm. right? It's in the space that's a little bit risky where the opportunity emerges. If everybody knew exactly how to design a stable coin and it was a crystal clear process with absolutely no regulatory risk, then it would be JPM coin. Right. Lindsay, what are the risks? I mean, you, I think you would maybe have the best seat on that or view on that of anybody seated here uh, being a, you know, part of an organization that's operating at some scale um, in, in the market. But what, what do you perceive as the real downside risks of, of um, you know, beyond this sort of high level, it'll, oh, it'll stifle innovation. What could a, a, a sort of misguided regulatory move really do in terms of hurting existing businesses and growing businesses in crypto? Yeah. Um, well, I think one thing is there is a lot of uncertainty about the regulatory um, requirements for building on protocols. So, for example, a lot of DeFi projects, they ask themselves, oh, do we need to get things like lending licenses? Do we need to be a broker-dealer? And 
because of this uncertainty, they may not be able to attract um, like traditional investors and they may not be able to attract uh, more conservative users even. And the other thing is that users themselves, like me and just the average Joe, like if we're using cryptocurrency, we may encounter frictions in the day-to-day -day use of cryptocurrency. For example, if I want to buy coffee with Bitcoin, I have to think, is it really worth uh, me recording the tax implications of this just for a simple coffee? Um, I, so I think lack of regulatory clarity and also, uh, I guess, maybe not uh, policies that are not thoughtful could lead in increased friction in day-to-day -day usage and also just uncertainty that would lead some types of parties to not be so enthusiastic about building on the technology or being a part of the investment in the technology. Mm. Sort of a chilling effect. I guess on the other side of that coin, what are the uh, what are the areas where maybe more regulation is needed? Uh, areas where abuses might be taking place, and and some uh, you know, maybe not even new regulation, but just enforcement of existing. Anybody here want to sort of weigh in on kind of areas where they see that other side of the of the risk coin here? Yeah, I think that there's a huge need for regulators to actually take the time to thoughtfully look at the activities that are happening and how they can apply their existing rules, right? And I think that, again, the stable coin, the Securities Act, and other things that are moving through the Hill are responses to the fact that some of the agencies, including the SEC, have been so slow to interpret their own rules mm -hmm. and how those rules apply to the space. Now, that's different than saying, we need clarity through new regulation. That's saying, we think we know how these rules apply. Will you just tell us yes or no if we can move forward with our business? And the answer is, we'll get back to you, and now it's like two and a half years later, and you're still waiting for them to get back to you. Oh, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's slightly problematic because this isn't a technology question. This is an activities question, mm -hmm. which is completely within the purview of the regulators who are looking at this. If I'm conducting this type of activity, regardless of what technology I'm using, can I do it or can I not do it? And what are the safeguards that I need to put in place? What are the controls? What is the risk that I'm looking to mitigate? And if I come to you and I spell all that out and your answer as a regulator back to me is shruggy, I think we should find that unacceptable. It's still pretty shruggy, I guess. Is that your experience as well, Lindsay? Um, I, think, I think regulators are making a good faith effort to engage with the industry. And I think they are reticent to um, say too much um, because as we know, this industry is still pretty new and we may not have seen all the long-term consequences of uh, different policy decisions. So, I mean, I definitely have a lot of sympathy for them being very slow to uh, give very defined um, clarity on mm -hmm. their interpretation of certain regulations. It's just, you know, there are costs and benefits associated with that. We had a question come in on Twitter specifically uh, about middlemen, uh, transaction middlemen who retain data that is then hacked. Um, and wondering if any, uh, you know, maybe Neha, you might have an opinion on this. What, where do you view regulators' role, and are they fulfilling that role uh, in this ecosystem in terms of, um, you know, uh, holding those entities accountable, uh, enforcing data security uh, provisions? Yeah, so, I mean, I think broadly, one thing that I haven't heard as much in the conversation has been around security, and mm -hmm. that's sort of a big focus for us right now, but, um, you know, these protocols and networks are very new, and uh, some of them are, some of the new coins and tokens are running protocols that are, you know, just invented in the last six months. So from a technical point of view, we don't really know how robust and secure these things are. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, we're using terms like digital assets and tokens that just lump everything together like they're all the same. So the idea that you could apply the same kind of rules and regulations to a totally experimental new consensus protocol that was invented yesterday and something that's been around and been running for 10 years is just kind of ludicrous. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and, I, and I don't think people are really recognizing the difference between these things and um, thinking about how to bake that kind of risk, the risk of security issues, the risk of problems at the protocol layer, of things breaking really dramatically. They're not necessarily thinking about how to bake that in uh, because it's a little bit of a new problem. There's new ways that things can break now. It's not just your custodian can lose your funds or uh, this, this data can get hacked. There's now, you know, there might be a, uh, a coup in your exchanges, take over the stake and decide to change the rules to go this way or that way. So these are new things. Um, and I'm not saying that we need new regulation, but just if, if our goal, if the sort of the ultimate public policy goal is to protect consumers, then we have to think about these things. I mean, not only, not only are we talking about new categories, but nuances within the categories where different kind of regulatory lenses and, and tools are required. Do you think a, a new three-letter or four-letter organization is warranted? I, I think that's a bit much. Right? But what's the right approach for, I mean, especially for a regulatory organization that might, I mean, you think of the CFTC, for example, in the U.S., you could think of their mandate as being very suited in a way, right, for novel instruments. SEC, perhaps not so much. Is there a cultural way in which these organizations, which these regulators need to kind of create a skunk works type of mentality where they have a team that deals with this specifically rather than lumping it in with the rest of their purview? Right, so, so just I've seen something like this um, in the central banking world, which is that you'll often see really amazing researchers at the table from the field of economics, or you'll see really amazing lawyers, but you will not see computer scientists. I think that's a huge problem, uh, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think all of these agencies uh, and all of these regulators really need to bring sort of advanced technologists into the room to talk about these things, and they can't just get that learning from industry, because industry is biased, industry is selling a certain point of view, um, and they know that, but they're having trouble figuring out what's real and what's not real, so I think they need to bring technologists into the conversation. You want to spend I, I more would, time in Washington, is that basically what that is? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of technologists. <laughs> I would actually contend that, that um, the SEC is actually, is very well suited to oh. handle like novel new uh, technologies. Oh. The, the, the framework that the SEC operates under um, is very, very flexible. It's mostly principles-based regulation, which is exactly what you want to see, which means that they look at the activities and they don't look at specific technologies. So if you're conducting certain types of activity around capital formation, then that might be regulated activity, and you don't have to have technology-specific criteria to understand that. The SEC's crypto czar has uh, Val Shapanik, who's wonderful, as an engineering background. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, they employ quite a few CS people, and it's, um, I, I think they're well suited to it. I think that the, the problem at the SEC is not that the staff isn't capable of handling novel new things. The unevenness in the response, I think, is, comes from the fact that as an agency, it's fragmented, right? right? And so you have trading and markets, which is one division over here, thinking about issues around qualified custodians, and you have corporate finance over here thinking about disclosures for capital formation to retail investors. And while I know that there are people who are trying to bridge those gaps, if you have, say, one person in trading markets who decides that they just don't want to see movement on qualified custodians for whatever reason, then it distorts the whole market and it holds back the whole industry. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. Right, um, but I think that from a in terms of the the authority that the SEC has to act in the space, the way that they have organized themselves with with Val as the cryptos are and is running FinHub and all these different things, I think they're perfectly capable of doing a good job of applying their rules neutrally across any technology that comes across their desk. Mm. Lindsay, I want to go back to another one you mentioned earlier, um, in addition to the um, regulating st stable coins as securities uh, proposed legislation. There's another one that I think maybe would be characterized as more friendly to crypto, uh, which is the Virtual Currency Tax Fairness Act. Um, can you, if for anybody who might not be familiar with that, can you sort of walk through uh, what, the, what the gist of that is and what the implications might be? Yeah, so this act, it excludes from gross income um, up to about $200 of gain from the disposition of virtual currency for personal purposes. So say you bought in Bitcoin at $15 and now it's worth 
I don't know what it's, the price is now, maybe 9000 Um, and you want to use it to buy, I guess, I don't know. What do you want to buy? Uh, a, a bottle of water. A Lambo. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Okay, a Lambo. Um, well, then up to $200 of that gain can be excluded. <laughs> or actually, yeah. Um, or I would just say a coffee. Uh, up to $200 right. of the gain can be excluded from gross income for income tax purposes. If I want to accept and a consulting I, fee in Bitcoin, for example, uh, I'm not sort of subject or, or pay a consulting fee. I'm not subject to some kind of capital gains on that kind of transaction. Um, there is a threshold limit yeah. at which you would be subject right, right. to uh, yeah, tax. And I think the ultimate purpose of this act is just that they don't want it to be extremely difficult to use cryptocurrency for things considered to be like currency. Um, so if I want to just use cryptocurrency to buy very low value items, I don't have to constantly think about the tax implications of that. Uh, and that generally, I would say, makes it much more user friendly to use cryptocurrency. Yeah, certainly for anyone who's interested in the use of, uh, of crypto assets as kind of a medium of exchange, right? That's uh, that would without that you sort of that use case can't really take off. Um, wh what would you say can be done? I mean, if you're if somebody wanted to support a legislation like that, what what are the sort of avenues? How would you think about ways in which the industry could be more supportive of of legislation viewed as positive, or on the other side of the coin, uh, you know, opposed to legislation viewed as negative? Yeah, you know, I think the cryptocurrency space has matured a lot in the past. Few years now we have um, organizations like Blockchain Association uh, basically helping to track new legislation, new developments in, reg in regulatory guidance, and they are a voice for many companies in DC. Um, I guess we also have com organizations like the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and they've actually done an amazing job tracking development and letting cryptocurrency projects that don't have, you know, a lot of experience or a lot of time to handle DC. Um, they keep these projects informed and they also help set up meetings so that projects can fly in and talk to people mm -hmm. in DC to make sure that their views are heard and they have an opportunity to educate the legislators and policymakers on the implications of certain pieces of policy. So, so Chamber yeah, of Digital think, Commerce, I, right? That's one. Any others that yeah. should be on people's radar in terms of lobby or industry groups? Coin Center, for sure. Coin, yeah, I'm thinking of them as well. Coin Center. Blockchain Association is uh -huh. one that yeah. uh, Dollar Development Foundation is a part of that okay. we think is doing a great job. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this. In 2017, there really wasn't as active of a landscape. There was mm -hmm. a project basically had to fund for themselves, but now there are more organized sources yeah. for advocacy. What are some of the, this is a, sort of the second topic that we had talked about in advance, and after we talk about this a little bit, I want to just open up for questions. But what, what are some of the areas, I mean, we've talked about some of the ways in which regulation can have positive or negative impact. What are some of the areas of, um, crypto assets and trust minimized systems where, where kind of existing regulatory frameworks uh, are just completely inadequate. Can we talk about some of the places where we really are getting out beyond what a, what a regulator could hope to get their arms around uh, today or in the near future? Uh, Neha, I think I'd maybe put that one up to you. Oh, I want to hear Patrick first. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, um, uh, I think what's... Um, I think what we're seeing, which is really interesting, is a philosophical shift in how we regulate financial services industry in general and financial services activities. Typically, for the last you know, few decades, financial services uh, regulation focuses on intermediation, right? They look to who the intermediaries are and they look to regulate intermediaries in the flow of of, of business, uh -huh. right? And as these new technologies start to disintermediate or at least to change the playing field so that the intermediaries pop up in different places, 
right? They may end up looking at across the field of who they regulate and seeing that they're not regulating the right people. Either they can't because there oh. isn't an intermediated place where they can go and meet their regulatory goals, right? Or they've popped up somewhere where they don't have a handle that they can pull, right? So maybe it moves to data intermediaries, right? And actual custody of assets is decentralized, right? And pushed to the edge of the network where um, you no longer have like a custodian in the middle of securities transactions who is doing the settlement of those assets or doing the, both the asset leg and the cash leg under the same roof. Is there a risk that you end up maybe pushing regulation out to the edges, regulating the behavior of individuals? I mean, that's the, that's the question. The question yeah. is, philosophically, do you want to live in a, do we, do we need to change our philosophy of how we regulate certain right. activities to push it out to the edges? Is that, does that fit with what we right. actually well, want to do? And transparent networks like Bitcoin certainly offer the opportunity to micro-regulate at that level, right? Mm, I don't know. I mean, it depends you on what you're trying to regulate, I suppose. Again, I mean, you, you can sort of monitor at the transaction level. The big I mean. challenge is what's the handle? It's not just seeing it. Mm. It's how do you enforce your rule, yeah, right. right? So it's one thing to say that I require... You know, what are you going to say? That everybody on the edge of a transaction has to KYC each other? Neha, can you please show me your apostille documents, <laughs> right? Like, first of all, that's ridiculous, and we don't want to live in that society. Um, uh, but uh, secondly, how would you, what's the handle that that gets enforced with? Right. right? That makes sense if you're looking at the world from an intermediary, regulating intermediaries perspective, because you can say, right. well, Whenever I pay Neha, I have to flow through Venmo. Yeah. So just let's regulate Venmo and make sure that they get all the documentation. Yeah. And importantly, they can make the sure flows can't go anywhere besides Venmo and the right. other regulated entities. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, or do, does it expand again? You had the question on Twitter about data intermediaries. Do they become more central? And then right. all of a sudden, do we have to issue new rules and regulations to capture? a different type of intermediary. Because I doubt that we're going to yeah. live in a really peer-to-peer -peer world where everything is super decentralized and nirvana, right? This will probably concentrate in new places, but they might not have a handle on those things, and the handle might not work. Right, right. Yeah, I, I remember I was pretty shocked when I realized a lot about how financial regulation works and how onerous it really is and how prescriptive it really is. I mean, the, the things that, if you want to be a money transmitter or a bank, the things that you have to do are pretty insane, especially coming from the internet world where things are not regulated uh, in such in the same way. And it seemed really backwards to me. Um, and, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense, Patrick and, and Galen. Do you really want to push everything out to the edges? Is that a feasible way to live? And I, I guess that my question is, is, are there certain types? First of all, I think it is inevitable that there are going to be intermediary less ways of transacting. And so the existing regulation we have, if it is just based on intermediaries, is not going to work. It's just not gonna work. It's gonna have to change. Um, some might say that we just shouldn't have any regulation at all, but I think uh, you know, we've seen that there, there can be types of activity that are, you know, we, we do want to have market integrity, for example. Like there are certain types of regulation and monitoring that we wanna have to enforce. Um, and where sh that should happen is a really good question. Uh, I wonder how much of it can be done with technology and can be done so that it's a little bit more automatic, maybe a little bit more private, um, but at the same time can still surface things that are useful. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, that, that it's obvious how to do this at all, but just like we've, we've moved to encrypted messaging. Encrypted messaging is standard now. Um, we use WhatsApp, we use Signal, Facebook, iMessage. It's all encrypted. These companies can't, they really, you can't see what you're sending. The government can't eavesdrop, can't backdoor this. Sharon's raising her hand, because maybe you can. Um, let, me, let me make another, let me finish the analogy, and then you can tell me why the analogy is wrong. But, but, <laughs> but like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that was sort of inconceivable that we would even have this. And, um, and, and, and so I think we might eventually get there for payments as well. We might, we might get to a point where we can, we can have these payments and we regulate in different places and we can actually have some sort of privacy. I mean, it's, me it's, oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Sharon, tell us where we're wrong. I, I, I want the heckler to. Oh, is this a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go, yeah, come on over. Are we at question time? No, please, time? yeah. Well,
Yeah, we can, we can jump right in, sure. in before I came into this one is so lightly regulated. So I wanted to like flip it around and just ask you guys, sorry to put you on the spot, like do we have things that, like so many of us here are computer scientists and many of us have been living in this ultra regulated, very gray area world. Like do we have lessons we can take out? Because you know, like things to, things to me that seem crazy um, and I have no you know understanding of regulation in cybersecurity actually, but for example, the Marriott breach, 400 million people's data was breached the impact on Marriott was $3 million. Right. $3 million because their insurance covered all the loss. So they had really good insurance and their you know, ne you know, technological supports were not there if someone went in, took 400 million people's records. And the people who were harmed were the public and the yeah. company itself basically paid nothing. It's so like as Neha was saying, you, you come from internet where it's such a lightweight yeah, regulation environment yeah. into financial, you're like, it's whoa. Like you come, yeah, it's crazy. That, that, is, that, is it really that it should be lighter in financial? Maybe it should right. be heavier. In, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's actually something that I'm, <laughs> right. I'm curious and I don't know, I just wanted to raise that for, for our industry just to start thinking about that because it's just so such a huge dichotomy. Yeah, I think that it gets back to this, like what is the shape of things, right? So if things are pushed more to the edge, and it is more about individuals taking control of their own kind of um, uh, financial activities, right? There is a sense of caveat emptor that to some degree, right? Yeah. And there is a private law remedy out there as well, right? In terms of tort law and things like that to hold people accountable if they harm you as an individual or even as a class. The question is like where does regulation come in, right? Where does state power come in to set rules for how you conduct your activity? A lot of times in the financial services industry, at least in the banking side of things, that flows from the fact that banking is not private sector activity exclusively. It's a public-private partnership with the government. It is a private franchise to help distribute money through the financial system. So. There already is like a huge distinction between how the financial, ser the base of how financial services work from how technology works. But now right? we have a blurring of those lines, right? We have money being information, cash but money But that's fine, it's back to the, that's just, Facebook and this is issuing what money. Sure, it's, uh, this right? is back to the yeah. future, right? Like, sure. We've yeah. already lived in that world, so right. we already know it, right? What's happened is in the interim, we built up big intermediaries that serve as money transmitters, right. that do some of the financial activity that we are regulating heavily today that is not banking activity. Mm -hmm. But if you go back, right, when we're living in a world of checks and paper money, right? I'm still believe, living in that world. I believe paper money still exists today, <laughs> although you got a check every now and then, yeah. right? Like, that was all pushed to the yeah. edge. And there were some real risks and downsides sure. to that. But check what, fraud. Uh, yeah, there's yeah, sure. L L Lindsay, I want to let you chime in here because I want to. I'm interested to know. I think you know, Stellar really sits right at the kind of at the crux of that uh, that intersection between money and information. Uh, how do you view some of that kind of philosophically speaking? You know, should should information be regulated more like money? Should money be regulated more lightly in the way that information is? What is what's the sort of what's your take on that? Yeah, well. <clears throat> my take is that it, so for example, on Stellar, um, you can create tokens that represent really any asset in any currency, and it could represent game credits as well. Um, so I think my philosophy is that it, information, it really depends on what this information is about and what, for example, on Stellar, what this token represents different types of assets should be regulated in different manners. So I think, you know, I think it's, the technology is just that, it's just the technology that's used to facilitate m like more efficient transfers, more efficient uh, oh. representations. And I think it really depends on what the underlying thing being represented is. It's really hard to say that there's one one fits one size fits all approach yeah. to all types of information. So who here knows who regulates Visa's core business? 
the payment network, Visa. Does anybody know who regulates Visa? No, it's a trick question. Nobody. <laughs> You're welcome, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the future. Um, but I want to let some of the people who are waiting at the mics ask. Go ahead there on the right. Thank you. Uh, in 2019, FinCEN published guidance to define which virtual currency companies are operating money service businesses. According to the guidance, non-custodial providers of an anonymizing software, which I interpret to be something like Tumblebit or Chami and CoinJoin, are distinguished from anonymizing service providers like Helix, which the DOJ um, is persecuting at the moment or has persecuted, in that they're conducting trade and not money service businesses. How do you think companies operating under this guidance, like Wasabi Wallet, for example, can maintain integrity and communicate to regulators that they're following the rules? So the question is, you're operating something like CoinJoin, not like Helix. How do you sort of navigate the tricky waters there of that kind of fine line that's been established? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, this is great. You're just hitting the nail on the head, right? <laughs> Perfect question. Thank you. Um, so one, I wouldn't say they were persecuted by the DOJ, I'd say they were prosecuted, but it's all a matter of perspective, I suppose, I get it, I know. Um, uh, um, so the question isn't what technology I'm using, the question is what is the activity that I'm conducting as an operator? When I use CoinJoin, am I using it for myself? Am I just running my own software? I downloaded a wallet, that's, maybe it's an open source wallet, I go on, I download the wallet, the wallet supports CoinJoin, or even a commercial wallet, and it supports CoinJoin as a protocol for forming transactions and sending and things like that, right? That's one thing, that's the activity I'm conducting. I wanna send Neha some coins, and I don't want other people to see that I'm sending Neha some coins. It's on my personal account, I'm doing it as an individual, push to the edge, right? That's one approach. The other approach is I send it to Galen's new company, privacycoin.com, right? Galen pools it with a bunch of other coins and takes on the activity of holding my coins and then sending them somewhere else while obfuscating the trail and not reporting on my activities or knowing who I am. Right. Now Galen is conducting very different activity from what I'm doing and we're both doing things that are very different from the people who develop the protocols that allow for the privacy to, to happen in the first place. So where does regulation fall in that spectrum? It falls on Galen's company. Doesn't follow me as a user middle. or the developer. There's something in the middle, which yeah. is somebody who uh, creates a place where you and I can find each other, never yes. takes custody of our coins, right. yeah. but is explicitly just yeah. running essentially like a public bulletin board where we will find each other. Yeah. And because of sort of network effects and how these things work, there's a few really large popular bulletin boards. It's like um, BitTorrent trackers. You knock one down, another one comes up. Like that's. That's what I see. And, and how and do you regulate those? Yeah, well, how do you or should you, right? Yeah, and, 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 and yeah, the interesting thing is it's, it's a lot easier to argue that you shouldn't be regulated in that way if you really are just a public bulletin board that is not taking yeah. fees. As I soon mean, as you well, add money into it, then it becomes a much well, like, or so maybe, you're, is, maybe you're promoting it, you're marketing that bulletin board. I think that was what they rested on with EtherDelta, right? Was that there was the marketing activity and that was a centralized function. EtherDelta was centralizing core activity. Yeah, exactly. And that was in the context of securities law, which right, is right, slightly right. different, yeah, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. So they were... Right. Um, but what about a coin join bulletin board? Right, a coin join <laughs> bulletin board is a, maybe it's in the middle. The question is, should we regulate that activity? That's number one. And then what are we regulating there? So if you're not taking custody of the funds currently, how there's no, this is what we're getting at earlier. Again, great question. There's no handle, right, from an anti-money laundering or counter-terrorist financing perspective. There's no handle to grab because you're just a data intermediary. You haven't, say you're not even taking a fee. Right, you haven't taken any custody of the funds, and the flow of funds is what people care about. That's the activity that's being monitored. Yeah, posting a bulletin board is regulating that would be extremely fraud, even if it's commercial. It's not speech. just a question of should it be regulated. It's a even, question of how would you even enforce such a thing. Even under the lower standard right, of commercial yeah. speech on the First Amendment, it would be very, I think, fraught to try and come after and bring a prosecution against somebody specifically just for hosting a web bulletin board where they didn't control the content. Uh, let other people come and find each other on it um, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion and didn't take any fees. I'm a bit more worried about it coins. because, I mean, if you're running, if you are running a public bulletin board, you can control mm -hmm. the content. You can, 
they, yeah. they could require you to do certain things about that content. But I think this is a really interesting question. And What's I, the I handle, though, right? From a financial, there's other I agree, sorts there's of- I there's no custody. There's other no kinds right. of regulations that might cover that. other laws that could that. certainly right. be right. violated. I think we, we might have time for one more question. Yeah, yeah. One, one quick one. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Okay. You've okay, been patient. Sure, sure. so uh, oftentimes the uh, regulation that's brought up with blockchain and, and Bitcoin is you know, financial services from that perspective, but there's also you know, the uh, CCPA, GDPR, you know, as far as data compliance and data ownership goes. So how, how is blockchain being affected by emerging uh, data legislation like those? And how can blockchain, like, how, how will blockchain shape that and those, those regulations in the future? Impact of increased data regulation on blockchain today. Lindsay, any, any sort of thoughts on how GDPR might be affecting firms operating <laughs> in a blockchain space? Well, I mean, I think generally speaking, one of the key reasons why a lot of institutions haven't adopted public blockchains yet is because of just general data privacy concerns um, when it comes to user transactions, but also when it comes to their own commercial transactions. They are not enthused about necessarily sharing all the details of all their internal business activity on a public blockchain. Yeah. So I think, you know, even without GDPR, there mm -hmm. is this strong concern from most companies um, about how can we better protect the details of our transactions. And that's why so many, there's so much, so many companies are interested in privacy preserving technology right now. Mm. Great. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to the panelists. We appreciate a lot of great perspectives, guys.